Alô? Alô? It's all good? Okay. So, um, hello everyone. We are now moving to our second panel, moving from sea and deep sea to the air. Um, to a panel that will discuss the challenges of the air in the Atlantic. And I have three colleagues here um, uh, for their presentation. Hugo Cabral from Navy, uh, Portuguese Navy, Professor Richard Byers from North Georgia University, and Professor P Peter Zwink from Universitat Wien. Um, I think we are gonna start with our colleague online, Hugo Cabral, with a presentation entitled Azores First Atlantic Stopover. Um, Hugo Cabral is a Portuguese Navy official that in the last decade has been dedicating himself to the Portuguese naval aviation history research, having concluded in 2020 a master's in maritime history with the thesis Naval Aviation 1912-1924 from the origins of the, to the loss of Sacadura Cabral. He has already published several articles on the subject in military and aeronautical magazines. Please, Hugo Cabral, we have um, 50 minutes for your presentation, and thank you for being with us here today. Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, loud and clear, I suppose. Uh, ladies and gentlemen from uh, Santa Maria and uh, also those uh, following us uh, through the internet, good morning. Uh, I would like to start by thank LPAZ Association for the kind invitation to participate in this conference and also to congratulate you for the initiative to organize uh, the conference. Indeed, uh, the Azores are the crossroads of the Atlantic. Uh, if in nowadays it is possible for us to do a direct flight from Europe to uh, America, not that long ago, this was not possible. The aircraft didn't add enough range for such a flight, so it was essential to include a stopover for refuel. And by the grace of God, we have the Azores almost in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, which in turn turned out this to be possible. So the Azores have a key role in aviation, in the Atlantic aviation. But unlike many people think, this importance and this use did not start uh, during World War II or by the late 30s with the Yankee Clipper flights. Actually, uh, this use and this importance began just a few years after the first uh, flight on the dawn of the 20th century. And it's exactly about this period that my presentation will be about the first use uh, of the Azores as a stopover. Well, the first flying machines, uh, despite the interest and the enthusiasm they arose all over the world, uh, they were not very useful. They could not carry a single passenger or any type of uh, cargo. Even so, um, a few men of vision saw the potential of the, this machine and tried to encourage as much as possible their evolution, their development. Among these men, I will denounce uh, Dutch Lamort and Ernest Archdeacon, uh, both uh, directors of the Aero Club de France and Alfred Emsworth, the director of the British new paper, uh, the Daily Mail. So they launched the trend to uh, pose um, challenges with associated money price for aviators and engineers to encourage them to build faster machines, machines that could fly uh, longer and make uh, reach further ahead. And actually it was uh, this uh, um, tendency that is behind all, all the milestones of early aviation development. Uh, for instance, the saint uh, first flight is associated with the Aero Club de France. The same way, uh, the first uh, crossing of the English Channel by Louis Blériot is associated with a prize launch, a challenge launch by the Daily Mail. And this was considered the first uh, air crossing. And from this point onwards, the challenge was to do a big, uh, uh, long flights, and mainly after the crossing of the Mediterranean Sea, the next natural challenge, of course, would be the cross of the Atlantic. And it was as early as 1913 that, the, again, the, the Daily Mail launched a challenge with an associated price of £10,000, something that today will be around €3 million, Euros, for the first aviator to cross the Atlantic in an aircraft in less than 72 hours. 
Um, it was virtually impossible uh, by this time to accomplish uh, such flight, but a few men believed that it could be possible. One of those uh, was uh, Glenn Curtis, an American seaplane constructor who associated himself with two pilots, John Cyril Port, a British naval officer who had a, a flying license obtained in Aéroclub de France, and Lieutenant John Towers, a U.S. Uh, naval aviator, actually was the second aviator of the U.S. Navy, uh, who together and with the sponsor of um, uh, American millionaire, they built a flying boat, they called it uh, the American. But soon they realized that the, uh, America was not able to fulfill the shortest route, which is from Newfoundland in Canada to Ireland. So they introduced a few changes in the aircraft, like a, a third engine and to carry extra fuel, and they considered also a different route, a route uh, with a stopover in the Zordish and uh, Lisbon. It was a much longer route, but with shorter legs, and this could make possible this flight. And this is the first time that the Azores are considered as a stopover for the uh, transatlantic uh, uh, flight. Uh, despite the, um, the preparations, uh, uh, quite advanced preparations, and uh, a plan to do the flight during the summer of 1914, with the outbreak of the Great War, this project just uh, faded away and was cancelled. Well, uh, the war... Uh, and, brought a lot of new technologies, uh, such as the first use of aircraft uh, for observation purposes and other purpose. And at the sea, uh, at the naval warfare, uh, the big new was the introduction of the submarine. It was uh, a key, uh, it was a, a game changer, the submarine. It changed completely the, all aspects of naval uh, warfare. And he had a key role because he was able to attack uh, the maritime lines of any grand theory and cut the maritime supply, which was essential mainly for naval powers such as Great Britain. And it was uh, kind of related with the U-boats, the entry of the United States in, in war uh, on April uh, 1917. And uh, after uh, the entry of the United States, the Azores increased even more, uh, the Azores and the Atlantic and the Azores by subsequently increased even more their strategic importance because, uh, not only because, but also because the Americans uh, fought that the Germans could invade the Azores and from this island launch attacks against their shipping lanes and against also their uh, east uh, coast. So, um, and uh, this conviction increased uh, even more when uh, on July 1917, uh, Ponta Delgado was attacked by a German U-boat. Uh, this way, the Americans soon in December 1917 established a big naval base in Ponta Delgado a base equipped with dozens of uh, destroyers and patrol boats, but also uh, some uh, coastal artillery and the air unit attached to it. Uh, it was the first marine aeronautic company, uh, the first um, United States Marine Corps um, air unit, and they put it where they be uh, believed it was more important and have more action, which was in Porto Delgado. This uh, small unit operated near Fort Sombrage in uh, Ponta Delgada, and it was the first time that the Azores saw an aircraft flying in February 19, 1918, and um, it was the first time that the Azores were used for a uh, military purpose by aircraft. Uh, this unit had uh, dozens of uh, hundreds of flights until uh, November 1918, until the armistice, and uh, has had a big, uh, huge air activity in Ireland. Portugal also um, was a participant in, in the war, uh, in, in our case more for political, uh, strate uh, political strategy and diplomatic reasons than anything else. And just like uh, other maritime countries, uh, we soon uh, realized the danger of U-boats. In our case, it was the attacks uh, at Funchal, Madeira Island, in uh, December 1916, that made us realize that our harbors were completely vulnerable to the menace of the U-boats. So, uh, by the initiative and perseverance of our uh, first uh, naval aviator, uh, uh, Sacadura Cabral, uh, he convinced the Portuguese government that the best way to fight this threat was with uh, true airplanes. And so, uh, he established, uh, thank, thank, uh, to his initiative, he was established a uh, defense agreement with France to supply Portugal with aircraft and all the support equipment to establish a network of uh, naval air bases along the Portuguese continental coast, coastline. 
Regarding the Azores was one pupil of Sacadura Cabral, Adolfo Trindade, also a Portuguese naval uh, pilot and an Azorian uh, uh, pilot, who proposed a similar arrangement with the United States. Uh, and uh, the Portuguese uh, government agreed with it. So um, we uh, established an, ag an agreement with the United States for the uh, supply of aircraft and equipment to install in North of Fayal Island uh, an aviation uh, center. As a matter of fact, Portugal was very aware that we could never operate such a center because we had uh, not uh, enough personal pilots and technicians. But uh, it was uh, important at that time to give the Americans the impression or the perception that Portugal was committed uh, to defend this source because Portugal was very afraid of a military, uh, American military expansion in the Azores and uh, was afraid of a takeover by the Americans, a similar process that had happened a few years uh, uh, before in Hawaii. Uh, so this was more like an intention statement than uh, necessarily an operational uh, need. Well, the war, despite uh, all the carnage uh, uh, it brought, uh, actually it allowed um, absolutely extraordinary uh, evolution in aeronautics. We started uh, with um, camp, uh, wooden canvas biplanes in 1914 to end with metallic monoplanes in 1918. Uh, it also uh, was the, it was also born a, a new industry, a aeronautical industry and a very profitable one. The same way uh, uh, um, appeared a generation of uh, hundreds of thousands of young men highly qualified as pilots and air engineers. And even during the war, the countries, uh, the nations were already asking themselves what will be the best way to take advantage of all this potential uh, the aviation is creating. And the answer was, okay, let's use uh, this potential to develop uh, uh, commercial aviation by using the uh, surplus aircraft from the war to establish uh, air mail uh, networks and to use the long range aircraft to explore, to test, uh, to validate uh, the future intercontinental and transoceanic uh, routes. And this is the main reason why just after the war, we see uh, lots of long range flights and uh, air crossings and it's the uh, start of a new uh, era for aviation, the so-called Aviation uh, Golden Age. One of the most, if not the most, uh, um, renowned flight of this time is exactly the uh, Atlantic crossing. And it was a relaunch of, from the Daily Mail just a couple of days after the armistice. Again, Daily, uh, the Daily Mail of Alfred Emsworth relaunches his 1913 challenge to, to cross the Atlantic. But this time, uh, dozens of uh, construction houses uh, prepared aircraft for uh, these uh, these challenges because it was uh, very possible uh, there was a high probability of success in this mission but uh, it was not a matter of money in this case but more a matter of prestige for the construction house in such a way that we had also governmental organization try to be the first to cross the the atlantic which was the case of the United States Navy and the Royal Air, Air Force. Uh, this, of course, not uh, playing for the price of the Daily Mail, but for the prestige of being the first to cross the, the Atlantic. Uh, in what concerns to the American project, it's a proposal of Commander John uh, Towers uh, to use uh, Glenn Curtis' uh, flying boat to cross the Atlantic. Not that John Towers was the very same John Towers that in 1930 was in association with uh, Glenn Curtis for the crossing of the Atlantic. The same way the British project, the Royal Air Force project, uh, to be more precise, was led by John, Commander John Cyril Port, now a, a Royal Air Force officer, and the same Cyril Port that in 1930 was in association with uh, Glenn Curtis and intended to use a Felix Sofuri, um, an aircraft, a flying boat of his own design, which is uh, direct descendant from the uh, early uh, flying boat uh, America. So history repeated itself. Well, but um, and oh, I missed a slide in here. Okay, never mind. Uh, unlike the um, unlike the uh, the project of the associated with Delmel, which intended to use the um, North Atlantic route from Canada to Ireland. These uh, projects of, of the U.S. Navy and the Royal Air Force, they wanted to include the the, the Soros route with a stopover 
uh, at this surge because the it was a governmental project so he had a strategic um, goal behind it which was to test the future atlantic route a route that will uh, be uh, with a stopover at the Azores. And this led to uh, diplomatic contacts with the Portuguese uh, authorities. Um, and that gave the, the Portuguese government the perception that the Azores will be very important for air navigation in, in the near future. And for such reason, instead of allowing the British or the Americans to install airfields in the Azores, Portugal made a huge investment uh, to... Um, be the Portuguese to build those airfields and air facilities to support uh, the transatlantic air navigation. Of course, uh, these projects uh, as an aviator behind, in our case, was uh, Secadura Cabral to advise the Portuguese government to um, uh, do such an investment. Because on his mind, uh, on his vision, Secadura Cabral realized that the Azores uh, would be paramount for the North Atlantic uh, um, air navigation. And uh, if we use our own airfields, we could demand the, their users to use Lisbon as the first airport in, um, in Europe. The same way, if we put uh, an airfield in Cape Verde, by then a Portuguese colony, we could uh, also demand the users to stop at Lisbon. That will give Portugal a total control over the uh, Atlantic air uh, routes. Same thing, um, well, actually, it was the same strategy, strategy that we use on the 16th century to take over the spice commerce in the Indies, take, uh, take the uh, important hubs, the important harbors, and control the spice commerce. So, Secretary Cabral saw this as a new age of discovery and a new uh, opportunity for, uh, for Portugal. Well, um, and also, um, it was not very difficult uh, for him to, in this context to convince the Portuguese uh, government to sponsor uh, an, air, uh, an air crossing to the South Atlantic, uh, to Brazil, uh, to open the South Atlantic route. So, in association with his friend, the renowned Portuguese uh, geographer, uh, Gacotin, he started to study and to prepare uh, this flight. Nevertheless, the first flight of the Atlantic uh, was made by the Americans, that John Towers uh, project. So in uh, early May 1919, a uh, flight of three flying boats departed near New York, but only one of them, the NC4, was able to reach Lisbon on the 27th of May. It was not John Towers' uh, seaplane, but uh, Lieutenant Commander Albert Reed's seaplane. So for that reason, it was like uh, was uh, lucky for Albert Reed to have his name in history to be the first man to, to cross the Atlantic, despite of being a John Towers uh, project. Uh, another uh, transatlantic flights follow on that year, but they uh, only came to prove that um, it was too soon to do transatlantic flights. Two things needed to be achieved. Aircraft needed to be more reliable, and uh, there was the need to establish a, a reliable uh, air navigation system to allow uh, transatlantic flights. So it was too soon, and like uh, it was expected uh, just after the, the war. Concerning the Portuguese uh, project to establish airfields in the source, actually uh, was given a, a huge budget to, uh, to purchase um, aircraft and support equipment, but uh, the center was never installed. Uh, the, although the equipment was later used in Portugal to establish a maritime uh, aviation center in Aveiro, but uh, in Ponta Delgada, we didn't have uh, any air uh, activity. So uh, it was like uh, uh, after the, the on oil, the project just uh, faded away. Nevertheless, uh, on 1992, uh, 1922, sorry, uh, the Secretary Cabral and Gacutin accomplished the, the heroic South Atlantic air crossing. It was a crossing of, uh, full of adventures and uh, setbacks. Uh, they, they needed uh, three aircraft, and it was uh, during uh, two months or three months, but they managed somehow to reach Brazil, uh, thanks uh, especially for the navigation system that they developed. So this man solved half of the problem for the transatlantic flight, which was to have a reliable uh, navigation, uh, air navigation uh, system. The other bit, the need for reliable aircraft, would happen just a couple of uh, one decade 
after and uh, on the late 30s, the Azores began, began again to be used as a stopover uh, for the Pan American flights and also during World War II was uh, of, uh, the key role uh, on the uh, Battle of the Atlantic. But everything of this started uh, with a dream, with men of vision who um, rapidly see the strategic importance of these uh, Portuguese Atlantic islands, an importance that uh, uh, may be not that relevant as it was uh, years ago, but it's still of a great relevance for uh, Portugal. And uh, I hereby finish my uh, presentation. I do thank you for all of your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugo Cabral, for your presentation. Um, Hugo Cabral, who is current uh, the Portuguese Navy Helicopter Squadron Commanding Officer. Um, it's, it's interesting to, to highlight how dreams and visions are important, but also I think one important message coming from the presentation is we should never desire for war, but we should also understand how uh, the, the consequences of changing in technology and society are due to the consequences of the war. And I think this was an important um, uh, message or argument coming from the presentation. So now we are moving to our second guest, uh, Professor Richard Byers, coming from the US on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, professor Byers is professor of European history at the University of North Georgia in the United States. He earned a BA in history at the University of Adelaide in Australia and a PhD from the University of Georgia. His book, Flying Man, Ugo Junkers and the Dream of Global Aviation was published by Texas AM University Press in 2016. And his presentation is entitled The Azores and the Strategic Air Power, A Very Brief History. Thank you, Professor, for being with us. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. <laughs> And I'd like to express my appreciation to the LPEAZ forum and also uh, all of the wonderful people who have made me feel so welcome here on Santa Maria Island. I'd also like to dedicate this presentation to Professor Alan Dobson, who was a giant in the field of aviation history. And uh, I am trying very uh, hard uh, to uh, uh, honor his memory today uh, with this uh, short presentation. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank my uh, fellow panel member, uh, Hugo Cabral, for that excellent uh, presentation, uh, starting us off today. And for those of you who would be more interested in learning more about aviation history here in the Azores, I would encourage you, in fact, I would urge you to pick up this excellent book by Guy Warner, Under the Goshawk's Wings, A History of Aviation in the Azores, a truly wonderful uh, you know, summary of the history of aviation here in the archipelago. I'm going to talk briefly today about air power and uh, as a strategic asset here in the Azores. Uh, and uh, after that, I'd like to take any questions that anyone may have. Throughout their inhabited history, the Azores archipelago's unique geographical position has accorded the islands significant strategic and security value. During the periods of transoceanic travel by sea, the islands consistently and repeatedly demonstrated their worth as sanctuaries, points of intersection and engagement, and as supply and communications facilities, as the uh, C panel noted earlier. In the aviation era, as uh, my previous panelists noted, the islands have also served as crucial transport and logistical linkages between hemispheres and continents, also acting as what we might call a fixed aircraft carrier group that can surveil and control the airspace over the Northern Atlantic as an anti-shipping and anti-submarine base, as a search and rescue station, and as an aviation fuel storage depot. Today, aviation links the Azores both together internally and with the rest of the world externally, and the archipelago's role as one of the world's most important strategic air power assets remains as relevant as ever today, I would argue, particularly in light of recent developments in Eastern Europe and the South China Sea. 
as uh, Hugo Cabral noted, the United States had long recognized the high strategic value of the Azores archipelago since the establishment of its first foreign diplomatic consulate here in 1795. When the United States entered the First World War in 1917, the unrestricted German U-boat or submarine campaign was in full swing, and American military leaders saw a naval and aviation base in the Azores as a vital part of the anti-submarine campaign in the Atlantic. After Germany declared war on Portugal in March of 1916, German ships and submarines shelled the port of Horta that year and also in the following year. Recognizing the key role the Azores could play as a naval airbase, US Marine forces landed at Ponta Delgada in February 1918, not far from today's Joao Paulo II airport, and established the first US aeronautical company. This contingent is arguably the oldest fully, fully operational and deployed example of US Marine air power. Their seaplane's mission was to secure the waters of the archipelago and combat German submarines throughout their area of the Atlantic, an attempt to close what was known as the Azores Gap. Through, although US forces departed after the war's end, a strategic air power relationship between the United States and Portugal in the Azores had begun that continues today over a century later. Apologize. There we go. My apologies. Slight technical problem. As long distance air travel and transport became technologically feasible after the First World War. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can't, mustn't give away the magic. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and dispense with the uh, presentation, the uh, PowerPoint entirely. Uh, Hugo's PowerPoint was far superior to mine and had much more wonderful photographs. Let me go ahead and just put this presentation up so you can see what I'm uh, going to argue here. Uh, the Portuguese government, after the First World War, recognised this new technology's potential in the archipelago almost immediately, establishing an airstrip and sending aircraft to the Azores into the to bring the Azores into the wider aviation world. Once again, the islands would serve as vital links in the transport and communication chains that connected the Atlantic world to the rest of the globe. Hosting Pan American Aviation Clipper seaplanes and visiting aviation explorers became a regular event for the islands and their people. And the Portuguese military, recognizing the rising global interest in the region, built the first military airfield at a charter on São Miguel which became operational in 1930. And then in 1934, a new airfield appeared on Teixeira at Lages Field, the direct ancestor of today's largest Air Force Base Number 4. Portuguese military aviation had arrived permanently in the archipelago, and soon other facilities were constructed at Ponta Delgada that augmented those on Teixeira. These aerial assets were used to protect internal security during the Azores Medeira Revolt of 1931. The Second World War saw the Azores return to the top of air power priorities for the Allied coalition, who recognized the need to incorporate the islands into global Allied strategy in multiple roles, both reprised, such as anti-submarine warfare, closing the Azores gap, and uh, as uh, for trans and inter-Atlantic search and rescue, and new roles, such as aviation fuel storage facilities, as a US Navy blimp resupply station, and as a key midpoint on the North Atlantic transportation route, ferrying planes and military equipment to Europe, Africa, and West Asia. The Axis also recognized the key strategic value of the Azores, 
And Adolf Hitler's Directive Number 18 of November 1940 specifically ordered the capture of the Azores Archipelago as vital to the Atlantic U-boat campaign and any future plans to invade the Western Hemisphere. So significant was the strategic value of the archipelago to Allied grand strategy that the United States tried to pressure Great Britain to support the forced seizure of the islands during the Trident Conference in November 1943. British diplomacy managed to resolve and diffuse what could have become one of the most controversial incidents of the Second World War. We are all fortunate that the British and the Portuguese are the oldest of friends in diplomatic terms. 1944, Portuguese and American engineers jointly constructed the airbase here on Santa Maria, which quickly became a key part of the transatlantic allied air power, communications and logistical network for the last year of the Second World War. The legacies of this collaboration are still all around us here on Santa Maria and the current commercial airport here on the island serves as a fitting legacy of this history. When the war ended in 1945, most military aviation activities shifted to the Lages airfield. By 1946, Lages Field was one of the largest and busiest airfields in the world, serving both military and now civilian air transport. The United States and Portugal agreed to a tenancy arrangement, initially only for 18 months, that continues on to this day and allows US, Portuguese and NATO forces to operate and use Lages Field alongside their Portuguese Air Force counterparts. The political quid pro quo of this arrangement meant that the US would ignore Portugal's ongoing colonial circumstances in exchange for unrestricted access to Lages Field. In the 1950s, aerial refueling was also added to the long list of air power operations carried out from the Azores, a role that ironically began to reduce the Azores' importance as a mid-Atlantic stopover for military aircraft by the 1970s. During that decade, Lages Field was also part of the NASA Space Shuttle program as an alternative landing site, but I'll leave that discussion to the space panel. These arrangements proved incredibly successful throughout the entire Cold War, as the Azores air power infrastructure provided crucial support to every major United States and NATO mission that involved global airlift, logistical and communications operations from the Berlin airlift in 1948 to Operation Desert Storm in 1990. These activities did generate some political blowback in other parts of the Lusophone world, as anti-colonial forces in Angola and other Portuguese colonies turned to the Soviet Union for assistance, opening up a space for Soviet and now Russian influence to expand across post-colonial Africa. Many of these roles were gradually wound down after the Cold War ended in 1991, and again after US force reductions in 2014, but the capacity for their resumption remains largely intact today. After the Cold War, this key logistical role continued despite force reductions and budgetary retrenchments, with the air power infrastructure of the Azores providing support to military operations and coalition exercises in Europe, Scandinavia, Africa, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 has surely refocused the minds of military leaders and strategists everywhere on the ongoing significance of the Azores archipelago as one of the world's most valuable and important strategic power assets. There is also the reality that most of the North Atlantic undersea transatlantic submarine coaxial cable network that sustains and enables our 21st century world's real and digital economies run through the waters surrounding the Azores archipelago. The Azores remain as important and as geostrategically valuable to Portugal, Europe, the United States, NATO, and the rest of the world 
as they ever have. And I hope that this long partnership and collaboration continues for at least another 100 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for your talk, uh, for this comprehensive talk on the Azores history that in the last 100 years came from, uh, for this external perception, a merely gap to a whole world. Right? Also, we, we connect this panel with the president one. We see how we really came from an idea of a merely gap in a space to a whole world with life and um, resources and its strategic importance. So, so thank you very much. And now we are moving to our third um, panelist, Professor uh, Peter Zwick from University of Vienna. Um, Professor Zwick is Irving Schrodinger Fellow at the Department of East European History, Institute for Eastern European History at the University of Vienna, and International History and Politics Department at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Currently, he conducts research on the integration attempts of European civil aviation during the 20th century. Thank you very much, Professor Zvik. Um, I'll pass the floor. You have 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, I hope everything is uh, okay. Uh, do you uh, I would like to thank uh, LPAZ uh, for uh, for inviting me uh, and uh, party and uh, Antonio Montiero uh, in uh, particular. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry that I wasn't able to to come to Azores uh, personally, uh, but uh, this wasn't uh, possible due to overload of uh, work. I'm really sorry. And I uh, hope there will be a chance of uh, having me uh, uh, within this forum in the next uh, next years. Uh, uh, the title of my of my uh, presentation is uh, "Exporting Communism on the Wings: Soviet Bloc Expansion into the Global South." Although um, this uh, seemingly has nothing to do with with Azores. There is uh, still some 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 connection, as we will see, and uh, uh, essentially uh, the block expansion towards the, the global south began uh, in 1940 uh, in 1954. Uh, there were essentially three three uh, engines and, or factors that drew. This expansion and this was the change in Soviet attitudes to neutrality and non-alignment after Khrushchev uh, take uh, reins after uh, Stalin's death, uh, decolonization in, in in the countries of the global south, and uh, technological advancement of uh, Soviet bloc aviation. Here, I mean the introduction of the new types of aircraft such as the Tupolev Tu-104 in 1956, Ilyushin IL-18 in uh, 57, or uh, Tupolev uh, uh, 111 in uh, 1961. Uh, sorry, Tupolev Tu-114 uh, in 1961. Uh, with this expansion, uh, Essentially, the, the the Moscow and uh, some and bloc countries uh, so three so seek threefold objective uh, threefold objectives. Uh, the first was to build political relations with non-aligned and decolonizing decolonizing countries. Uh, the the second objective was the to, to promote a socialist way of modernity as opposed to a capitalist way of modernity. And the third level was uh, quite practical, and this was to trade uh, exotic produce that weren't accessible or cannot be planted in, in, in the North climate. 
such as such as uh, bananas and ananas and all this uh, exotic produce in exchange for economic and infrastructural assistance. Uh, that mean meaning help to build roads, airports, dams, factories, schools in in the countries in African and uh, developing countries. Um, the the greatest uh, well. From this is a particularly uh, a map or example of how the Czechoslovak airlines expanded between 1958 and 63. Here you can see uh, a map, route map in uh, 58. Uh, you can clearly see that the only um, transcontinental service was to Cairo. Uh, but in 1963, just small five years, there were uh, services to West African coast, Middle East, Far East, Singapore, and then uh, um, across Atlantic to, to Cuba. Uh, similar expansion can be seen uh, in the case of Euroflot. This map is from 56, if, I, well, if I'm correct. And uh, here you can see that all, with the, ex with the exception of, of uh, Scandinavia, uh, the Soviets didn't fly any farther than was uh, any farther west as Prague or, or Berlin. Uh, but uh, in uh, 19, this is a picture from 1963, you can see a big expansion that merely echoed what the Czechoslovaks have done. Uh, it was meaning flights to, to, to Cuba, West Africa, uh, Central Africa and uh, India and uh, Jakarta, Singapore. Uh, uh, the most interesting uh, route of this all for for the for the in the context of Azor was the route to 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 Cuba, and here I uh, here you can see the uh, I drew this map based on, on a calculation of the Czechoslovak Airlines in, in uh, 1960. So they planned to, to, to establish, to essentially, they had opted for, for three routes. And uh, one uh, was from, one, sh one option was to fly to, to, to Cuba via Morocco, Azores, and then uh, Bermudas. The other, other possible route was uh, from Prague to Paris, then Azores, and uh, again, Bermudas. And the last option was to fly, uh, well, well that across uh, the north, uh, but this option was, uh, well, it was the, the most difficult one because of uh, strong uh, winds in the, in the North Atlantic. So Czechoslovaks prefer a, a route via via Azores, but um, due to pressure from 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 the United States, this uh, that that Washington exor exercise on on uh, on uh, Salazar's Portugal and uh, Franco Spain, uh, the the Czechoslovaks were def uh, the the uh, were stripped of of access to Azores. And then the other problem was uh, that they wanted to land it at Bermudas, which is which was uh, or which is uh, which was uh, British territory, but the uh, uh, but the uh, airport there was uh, operated by the by the American forces. So uh, and the Americans said that they will rather retreat from from ICAO. Than, uh, uh, than allowing Czechoslovaks to fly to, to Kindley Airfield. Uh, so it took two years until it was made uh, possible for them to fly. And uh, after a Cuban missile crisis, a little bit could the, the tense atmosphere surrounding uh, Cuban missile crisis cooled down a little bit in uh, uh, 6263. Uh, Canadians, in the end, uh, allowed to 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 Czechoslovaks to use uh, Gander and, and Newfoundland, and uh, Danes uh, 
uh, allow Czechoslovak uh, Czechoslovaks to fly through Danish airspace. This allowed them to circumvent uh, a ban from from West Germans, and they were able then to fly over Denmark and uh, United Kingdom onward to to Newfoundland and then down to down to Cuba. Uh, similar problems uh, were f- well, and the problem was that the the, the best uh, Soviet plan that was suitable for this uh, this illusion I was fixing. Uh, wasn't able to 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 fly at this long distance, so the Czechoslovak airlines um, uh, leased a uh, Bristol Britannia from Cubana and uh, flew for a couple of years with with Bristol's. Uh, for some time during the period of Prague Spring, they uh, considered to buy Vikers uh, Viscount YC10. Uh, quadjet, but the Soviets uh, forced them to to buy IL-62, Illusion IL-62 instead. Uh, pretty similar design. Um, it's possible that even the Soviets, since they had access at the time to 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 Vikers, that they may have even copied this this, this design. Uh, but uh, for for unlike Czechoslovaks, uh, when the Soviets Consider the flights to to Cuba. Uh, they didn't even uh, then even even think of uh, of Azores uh, because it was far easier for them, or they wanted primarily to fly either via Zurich or Belgrade down to uh, Conakry, and then cross cross southern uh, uh, Atlantic to to Recife in Brazil, and then fly. Flight north to uh, north to Cuba, but uh, Saiku Ture, uh, Senegal is a leader. He he thought or he allowed uh, the, the such flights. Uh, so this Aeroflot carried two or three. Uh, uh, well, with with great pomp announced that, but then the Kennedy administration told uh, Saiku Ture that if the if the flights uh, would not stop, they will not uh, deliver grain or and corn anymore. What uh, Senegal is uh, uh, desperately needed, so Secretary changed his mind and uh, for, forbade uh, Aeroflot from from using Conakry Airport for flights to for flights to Havana. Uh, so the Soviets uh, were were thinking wouldn't were determined to to fly to Cuba, so they. Uh, uh, used uh, one, they modified two, three, uh, two plus uh, 114 aircraft and added, squeezed in additional fuel tanks and uh, flew uh, the northern route via Murmansk and uh, uh, Greenland uh, over international waters. So uh, nobody was able to stop them or deny them the rights. But uh, uh, ever since they established the service in December 1962, they 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 looked how to how to make the route more economical, uh, because even when they were flying there, and when one considers that they uh, that they uh, were wanted to de- to transfer or transport some uh, military material from from Soviet Union to Cuba, uh, t- well the payload. Of uh, of uh, improved of improved TU one hundred fours was just a few tons. It was like six seven tons of material they can transport. So it was highly highly an an, an economical activity. But uh, and uh, in fact they have something to exchange for 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 such a route. And this was a territory of Siberia. Because uh, when Stalin in uh, 40, 1944 decided that uh, Soviet Union would not uh, participate in Chicago conference and uh, and the Soviet uh, airspace will be closed for all airlines other than uh, Euroflot, uh, this forced the Western European airlines uh, when they start to fly to far east either via Cairo uh, and India. Or when more advanced aircraft, uh, such as DC-7, uh, were 
introduced in and in, in, in larger numbers they flew across the across the arctic so up upwards to greenland and anchorage and then down to 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 tokyo uh, but uh, as it's clear that the, the straight route or more direct route is uh, across the across the uh, was across or still is across the russian territory across siberia uh, so here you it took uh, incredible 15 years till it was possible or they were able to to come to agreement over the use of uh, siberia for for western airlines in exchange uh, that the uh, scandinavian countries allowed them to overfly uh, overfly scandinavia on 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 their on the routes to 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 north north america uh in exchange the soviets allow the the western airlines to fly across siberia uh on a trans siberian route route from europe to 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 far east particularly south korea and uh, japan uh the first airline to fly on this route was uh, japan airlines in uh, 1970 and uh, the first service was uh, from Tokyo to Paris via via Moscow, and then one month later, a service to London was was uh, by Japan Airlines was introduced. But still, because the frequencies were so few, uh, the airlines uh, it was like seven frequencies a week. Uh, the 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 airlines continued to fly uh, over the north. Uh, after this, uh, the Soviets introduced the, the flights to 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 North America. Uh, this map it's from nineteen something like nineteen seventy seventy six or seventy seven, uh, and uh, you can you can see by that uh, but that for the for the route to 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 Havana they uh, they used uh, rabbit and returned rabbit in Morocco uh, and uh, they returned the plane returned uh, over over Greenland uh, because uh, the wings uh, winds were uh, much more well because of the direction of, of, of winds uh, in in general I think all these uh, all these flights uh, all, all and all these agreements, uh, enabled the the, the uh, spread of uh, globalization, particularly after after the fall of the of the uh, Iron Curtain. But uh, uh, nowadays, because of the of the war in Ukraine, we simply return to 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 1950s. When the Western airlines were couldn't fly to to over Soviet, uh, Soviet territory, nowadays they cannot fly over Russian territory, and the uh, so Soviets could not fly to to Western Europe and other parts of the world, and uh, Russians nowadays cannot fly anywhere. So, uh, except of international flights over international borders. Um, well, I think this is all, and thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Zvig, for your presentation and showing actually how aviation uh, <laughs> brought together uh, <laughs> okay. Now showing how aviation brought together during the, the second half of the 20th century acceleration in terms of, uh, in technical terms, and social process. So um, it was a very rich presentation. Thank you very much for that. We have uh, 20 minutes, um, about 20 minutes for questions, even 50 minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, and for that, we need questions. <laughs> so I invite you all to um, start a conversation with our panelists. 
I'll bring, I'll take, the, take note of the questions. <laughs> okay. oh. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Online? Yeah. Can yeah, you yeah. hear me? Yes, I can. On this? On this? Hello. Well, now, now I guess you can hear me. Thank you very much for your uh, very interesting presentations, the three of you. And um, as this is not directly my field of study, I have a very general question. So excuse me for my, my uh, very general overview. My question would be, as, as uh, all of you have mentioned, the ongoing war in Ukraine, very generally, to what extent do you think that the Atlantic will uh, will emerge as with increased significance, given the war and the return to power politics? I mean, the Atlantic will it immediately, as a consequence, increase, and and the increase of this importance and the increase of the importance of the Azores will um, will be seen in which domains, uh, in your opinion, concretely. Thank you very much. Thank you. We may maybe start with Hugo Cabral, following the order here of the panel. Thank you. Uh, well, actually, it is my opinion that uh, you know, the uh, only expected thing that is that everything is unexpected. Uh, we live in strange times. Apparently, we are under a perfect storm. We had uh, diseases, war, and um, uncertainty. Uh, so uh, I believe that the, the Assurg will have a key role, as he had in the past. I don't know which one will be. Uh, now even the Atlantic seems to be losing the, the importance uh, when comparing the, the, the Pacific is uh, having. Uh, now we have the Northwest Passage, the Greenland is equally important, but uh, it is my conviction that somehow the, the importance, uh, the strategic relevance of the source will emerge. Uh, I don't know when and how, but will emerge. So it is our duty as nation to uh, take care of these islands and be prepared to the unexpected. Thank you. Professor Bias. Thank you for that excellent question. Um, it, as my, uh, as my uh, presentation Thank suggested, um, uh, as my uh, presentation suggested, I think that um, the Azores has always been a crucial uh, part of the uh, geostrategic framework for the uh, NATO alliance and also for uh, the Atlantic world more generally. Uh, I think it's just been uh, more or less uh, pulled back out uh, to the sort of the front mm -hmm. of uh, public awareness and consciousness as a result of these geopolitical events. Uh, and I believe that, uh, like uh, Hugo said, I, uh, we live in interesting times and uh, be prepared for rapid change. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see uh, rapid change here in the Azores uh, in terms of an expansion, a, a renewed expansion of uh, the uh, military and aviation infrastructure here to, uh, to deal, with these, uh, deal with these rapidly changing geopolitical circumstances. Thank you. Professor Zvik? Oh, well, I, uh, I think uh, my, my co-panelist said, said everything. And, uh, uh, well, the only thing that might be a little bit or at, uh, or at another level is that uh, uh, although there is a big, great uh, portion of tension in, in, in the China Street, and uh, in, in history, except for uh, World War II, uh, 
I, I think uh, there wasn't such uh, such a big potential for for having uh, two really large conflicts on on two opposing ends of the world, on, uh, and uh, it's therefore it's really very hard to hard to hard to uh, tell or evaluate the exact importance of Azor. But uh, one thing is uh, really very clear: uh, they will they <laughs> have been important, and they will be important. And 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 uh, and all NATO NATO strategies for for the for the future. Micheli. Uh, another question that is, I hope. Uh, related to what you said, uh, we have talked about the seas, the the aviation, of course. Uh, but I'd like you to, if possible, to open the discussion also to another fundamental change that happened in the Atlantic Ocean, which is the transatlantic cable. And I'm just because of it, it, I'm curious about this, and I see the map, of course. Uh, the first one was between Newfoundland and Ireland, but then there's another one, historically, that goes from Newfoundland to then Spain and France, passing through the Azores Island. So if you, according to your knowledge or your studies, what has been the importance uh, of these kind of communications played in, by, through the Azores Island? Thank you. Well, um, actually, um, actually, the, the, the most logical route was indeed uh, through the Azores, then Spain, um, and then uh, England or, or, or France. Um, but it was a part of the strategy of the, uh, the Portuguese strategy to have as a requirement of, for the use of this source by other nations that the next stop will be in Lisbon not, and not in, in Spain. Because there was this vision that uh, the, air, uh, the tech, uh, air, uh, airport taxes and uh, hotels and tourism will be um, a startup, uh, will bring lots of uh, profits, uh, lots of uh, profits uh, to, to Portugal. So that's one also of the reasons that we invest uh, a lot to build an airfield in Azores to have as a, a counterpart, uh, to, uh, as a, um, a compensation the first European airport being Lisbon and not uh, Vigo, uh, as it was uh, the logical plan uh, for it. And of course, um, we were in a very strong position to, to demand this to other nations because they had to use, they could not use Lisbon, uh, but they had to use the source. So it was a strong uh, argument from the Portuguese to force the other nations to land in Lisbon, which actually uh, tended to happen uh, during World War II. Lisbon became the major airport, not um, well, not because not only because of the strategic position, but it was a neutral country, and uh, in terms in political terms, was much uh, easier and uh, better to, to land in Lisbon than in a pro-German uh, Spain. Um, it's an excellent question. I'm not going to provide an answer that probably will satisfy uh, the, the questioner. I just wanted to respond with um, an anecdote. Um, and the anecdote is, is that the first military action carried out by Britain in World War I was the severing of the submarine cables that linked Germany to its colonies. Um, just as a reminder, uh, that was uh, some time ago, but uh, I believe that UK strategy has not fundamentally changed in terms of its understanding of the awareness of this communications network. Um, and I'm sure that um, our adversaries are aware of this. And I'm sure that they are, uh, you know, uh, ready, if necessary, to carry out similar actions in the event of, uh, let us hope not, but in the event of a, of a wider conflict. Um, and uh, I think we must be aware of this and, and we must, uh, you know, take steps to 
uh, construct contingency plans to defend uh, that uh, communications infrastructure. Uh, and of course, the Azores has to play a very important role in that contingency planning. I don't know if prof not Hello. Uh, I don't know if Professor Zvik wants to uh, add something. Uh, if um, I have a question to Professor Zvik. Yeah, well, I think my, my, my co-panelists said everything uh, regarding uh, cables, so. Yeah, well, I think my, my, my co-panelists said everything regarding cables, so. Please go ahead with, with your question. Okay, so I, I have a question to Professor Zvik. Um, Please go ahead. Okay. Um, there's still an open discussion on the origins of the Cold War. And um, uh, one of the, you know, one of the uh, ways of seeing the origins and blaming the U.S. is to look at aviation and, uh, and post-war planning regarding aviation and how the U.S. was building a global network. Um, and, and for me, this is um, including uh, the 946 Santa Maria Agreement is linked to the um, demand from Stalin and Molotov to review the status of the Turkish Straits. This is one of the reasons why we have um, um, uh, a non-permanent agreement in 1946. The U.S. Uh, demanded to suspend negotiations here because the Russians were uh, using the case of the Azores and other cases to blame the U.S. Um, in their plan, supposed to plan to build a, ne a global network to check uh, the Soviet Union. And, and this is one of the reasons we have an agreement only in 1948. But what we don't know is uh, the Soviet uh, or Russian perspective on civil aviation during the 1940s. I know the work of Professor Zvik um, uh, focus on a later period, but I'd like to know if he found something that could help us to understand a Russian or a Soviet perspective on civil aviation in the beginning of the Cold War. Um, uh, um, well, it's a complicated, not, not as much complicated question. I would not uh, blame the United States for, for attempting to... to uh, or it was uh, it for threatening the, the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, it wasn't at least it wasn't direct. If if the the, the Stalin understood it in this way, it's uh, it was his paranoid thinking as as much as as it's put in paranoid thinking nowadays. And uh, but uh, Soviet. Uh, so we're thinking on development of civil aviation links uh, in, in 1940s was uh, quite a little bit strange one. Uh, they, they proposed the U.S. to organize a, a connection between New York and, uh, and Moscow in such a way that the American planes will flew to uh, Cairo. Um, then it was still a part of Egypt. And uh, from where Aeroflot will pick up the passengers and uh, carry them to 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 uh, Moscow. And uh, once, uh, of course, the Americans said no because they preferred a, a free regime, as Professor Dobson, uh, late Alan Dobson, uh, pointed and showed in his uh, many many books on. On uh, civil on the development of uh, transatlantic aviation in, in 1940s, and uh, uh, towards towards the late 1950s, the situation uh, excuse me towards the 19, late 1940s, the situation evolved in such a way that uh, they used Prague as uh, as a main uh, gateway to to get people from from anywhere. To, to Soviet Union because Czechoslovak airlines they all still had some flights to to Western Europe uh, and uh, uh, some Western airlines were still flying to Czechoslovakia uh, and Aeroflot was flying to Czechoslovakia so they changed passengers there 
but even the uh, the airlines of uh, satellite countries were not allowed into Soviet airspace until, uh, well, actually until Stalin died. So uh, once Stalin died, uh, this 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 uh, attitude became a little bit more relaxed, and they started to to use uh, Trans-Siberian air route as a, as a uh, negotiation to get access to to, to uh, North America and farther farther down Caribbean. Uh, but uh, essentially, they they wanted to have as few airlines uh, within their territory as possible. So that that, that was uh, 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 Soviet policy in nineteen throughout the essentially throughout the Cold War. I, I hope I uh, fully answered your your question. Thank you, Professor. We are in in the session. Okay, and we are resuming our, our works at 2 p.m. local time here. Thank you very much. Thank the organizers and the panelists. See you at Thank noon. you very much. Thank you very much. It's really my pleasure. Thank you.